Penn State versus Iowa was unreal, with Spencer Lee almost getting pinned in the first five seconds of the dual meet, RBY earning a major pin, and the upper weights determining the final score of this duel. To me, it was absolutely mind blowing. But I've seen other people saying that it was a complete snooze fest and maybe that's why this next stat I'm about to tell you you might not believe it but Iowa scored only two takedowns throughout the entire duel meet and it wasn't by Spencer Lee who scored his reversal it was by Real Woods and Max Murin I'm sure Tom Brands had the Hawkeyes shooting double legs all the way back to Iowa. And nonetheless, it was an exciting duel meet. I'm going to give you the rundown as well as a couple of things on other teams. Pitt earned a major upset. Ohio State and Iowa State earned major road sweeps. So let's stop stalling and start talking this week's wrestling headlines presented by Defenso. And our first wrestling headline is that Penn State versus Iowa was mind-blowing. At least to me it was. And I had an absolute blast at this event. It was honestly a who's who of wrestling with everybody in their mother being there. Bo Nickel, Micah Parsons, Shane Sparks, Jim Gibbons, Bo Bassett. Holy moly, I couldn't believe everybody I saw there. And it was incredible. I was sitting Matt's side to witness the 23-14 victory for the Nittany Lions over the Iowa Hawkeyes. And it was a fun duel meet from start to finish. I mean, it pretty much came down to the wire. And ultimately, Kel did end up getting the victory over Brands. And this was his 100th Big Ten dual meet victory, which I thought was really cool. I didn't even realize that was going on. But I attended this event, and you see, this it was a packed event. 16,000 wrestling fans. And if you weren't there, you were watching online. And this dual meet started out strong early on. And you see, Marco Vespa came out for the Penn State Nittany Lions. We thought Gary Steen was going to come out, but he took him down, took Spencer straight to his back, and nearly pinned him. Now, I may be exaggerating a little bit with that nearly pinned him, but he did take it to Spencer. Now, Spencer, <laughs> within the first 15 seconds of Vespa taking him down, Spencer ended up reversing him and getting back on top. And yeah, he pretty much tilted him up like as we expected, because if you don't take advantage of that, Spencer's just going to tear you apart. He's not going to let you forget it. Now, I will give Marco Vespa some credit because while we thought Steen was going to come out, Vespa, the young guy who very much doesn't have many matches under his belt yet, came out and he didn't, I mean, he didn't get pinned. And that was actually a win for Penn State because when Spencer's going out and pinning the number two, number three guys, that sets the tone for the rest of these guys. And, um, you know, Vespa, he came out and honestly, he did his job. And that led us to 133 pounds with RBY and Brody Teske, which was a good match until the very end when you see RBY took Teske straight to his back from feet to back, cradling him up and stuck him. Making a real statement was RBY. The cool thing was, this was actually RBY's birthday weekend. So what a way to start out this duel with Spencer Lee getting bonus and then RBY getting bonus right after that. This duel continued on with some matches that were a little bit tighter as Bo Bartlett and Real Woods ended up wrestling to a 4-1 to decision in favor of of Real Woods, which led us into the 149 pounds match with Max Murin and Shane Van Ness going at it. And, you know, I'll be honest, I I, I don't think I underestimated Max Murin a bit because he can wrestle a lot of these guys very closely. He doesn't. He's not like a bonus scorer like Spencer Lee, right? He's going to wrestle these guys to tight matches. And Van Ness is very much an up-and-comer who, this was his first, I think, major test of the season. He wrestled him well, but Max Murin held his ground and beat Van Ness, which sent us to 157, with the crowd going bonkers that Levi Haynes, the true freshman, came out and beat Kobe Seabrook. But really, they, they were excited about him beating Kobe Seabrook, but really they were just excited to see Levi Haynes step onto the map because he had used his five dates of eligibility so far this year because as true freshman, you're able to wrestle in five dates without them counting as without you losing your red shirt, essentially. And he wrestled in this and, and, and throughout the season, wrestled five dates, and Kale pretty much was playing tricks with Tom Brands, even with this new rule. If he wrestled four matches, well, we know he's probably going to come out and wrestle the Iowa Hawkeyes in that fifth one, but he didn't. He wrestled all five, and he came out, and now we know that Levi Haynes is officially going to be Penn State starter at 157. And I'll tell you what, he's a title contender at least an All-American 
at least an All-American contender. Patrick Kennedy and Alex Facundo went into tiebreakers 2-1 to one with Patrick Kennedy ended up winning because of riding time, sending us to 174. And the thing was, that 165-pound bout was absolutely crucial for the Iowa Hawkeyes to get. They needed to win that match in order to stay in the entire duel meet because Murder's Row was coming up with Sirachi and Brooks and Dean and, and even Kirkley. And while they had a lot of good matchups against other Hawkeyes, this was, I mean, it was crucial. And that sent us to 174 with Carter Sirachi and Nelson Brands. This was a very tight match. You see him throwing a little bit of like craziness at the air uh, at the end there. I'll go back to that. The the typical Brands kind of craziness that you love to see. And it's because Sirachi was hitting his footwork at the end there. But he did his job. He held him to a decision. And this was the only match, honestly, I will say where Brands, I don't think, was wrestling to win. I think he was kind of stalling out Sirachi. I, I don't say that often, but this is the case where it was happening. And I think it was good. I think he needed to do that in order to make sure Sirachi didn't get bonus points. Because I thought he it was it was a for sure lock at least to get a major decision. And so this at this point, the Iowa Hawkeyes had Penn State sweating. Right? I mean, it was a, a close match. Iowa was up 14 to 12 with only three matches left. I wish I could have walked over there. To the, to the lineup and actually given Penn State like some defense soap wipes because I saw sweat dripping off of their brow. Like this was not supposed to be this close of a matchup. The, the great thing about these defense soap wipes is that while they were watching and it could have got the sweat off, it's also great sometimes it takes a little bit of time from when the match is over and the time you actually get to the shower and you, by that time you're letting all this ringworm and impetigo actually build up on your skin. Which That's one of the nice things about these body wipes is they help to protect your skin during that time from the four-hour contagion window until you can get to the shower and use other defense soap products to fight that bacteria. And that actually led to 184 pounds. And Aaron Brooks was supposed to be wrestling Abe Assad. Didn't end up sending out Abe Assad. He was, it seems like he was injured, which was unfortunate. He was pinned the previous week. This time, he didn't wrestle Assad. They sent out Drake Rhodes, who ended up getting tacked by Aaron Brooks. And, I mean, this was a, a, a good point. While Penn State was sweating before, AB scored about nine takedowns, putting Penn State up 17-14. to 14, Just switched that dual meet right around, leading into 197 pounds. And this was a crucial match as well between Max Dean and Jacob Warner. Because if Dean won, it decided the duel meet, and that's ended up what happened. Is that Max Dean, just like Defenso, came in and defended his house. He won with incredible riding time over Jacob Warner, and he looked good. You know, not the most exciting match, as we all kind of expected. Leading into 285, Cassiope was going to need the pin. Wasn't end up able to get it. But Greg Kirkfleet did look really good. While he had multiple losses to Kirkfleet in the past, he ended up beating... Him at the All-Star Classic at the beginning of the season and coming out and beating him in this duel. He was riding those ankles really tough on top. And this was one of the best matches I've seen Kirk wrestle this year, especially coming off of that loss to Mitz in Paris where he didn't look that great. And he may not look that great every match, but he can at least feel fresh when he's using defense soap products. I don't know if Kirk uses them or not, but I know that many wrestlers do because it helps protect them from the diseases that are on those dirty mats but also help you keep fresh and stay fresh. Just like that's why I use Defense Soap products. Now, I called this rule at 25 to 15. It ended up 23 to 14. And I expected a Penn State win. But my takeaway here is that Penn State looked good. You know, they can legit have five national title contenders, right? RBY, Starachi, Brooks, Dean, Kirkfleet. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think they have two others. Levi Haynes. And Bo Bartlett. Do I think all seven of those guys are going to win? No. But I think they still stand a chance. And that's the thing is we don't know what to expect in the postseason. But we can expect your skin to be healthy when you're using Defense Soap products. If you want to try their products out for yourself, go to DefenseSoap.com. Thanks to Defense Soap for sponsoring this video. And our second wrestling headline is that the ACC title is not yet accounted for. Because Pitt decided to throw a whole wrench into the ACC by defeating the Virginia Tech Hokies. They defeated them over the weekend in stunning fashion. They said, you know what? We don't care. We may have lost to Maryland. We may have lost to WVU. 
two unranked losses, but we're not going to lose out on the ACC title. They defeated the Virginia Tech Hokies 26-12. to This is really impressive because the Hokies are just coming off of a major win over the NC State Wolfpack. And I thought the Virginia Tech was for sure going to win the ACC title with that. And we'll get to like what could actually happen here. But what happened in this match? Well, Pitt came out firing strong right away with a pin with Colton Camacho at 125 pounds. He beat Cooper Flynn in the first period by fall. They moved on to 133 pounds with Mickey Phillippe earning an impressive victory over Sam Latona. This is, to me, like, this is Mickey Phillippe's best win since probably Dayton Fix a couple years ago. Like, he's just been kind of struggling a bit over the years. And I'm happy to see that maybe he's finally peaking at the right time. And with the rest of his team that's been doing well. I mean, in this dual meet, you also had Pitt winning 7 out of 10 matches over Ma Cole, with Cole Matthews winning, with Nino Bonacorsi winning, their top guys winning. And this is ultimately what the what happened. They came out strong with three wins at the beginning until Caleb Henson and Bryce Andonian came in for the Hokies to pull off some wins. And they fired back pretty strong. But it ultimately wasn't enough here because... Pitt was that team. Now, Pitt won the remaining four of the five bouts here, uh, with the only one exception being Makai Lewis earning the victory for the Virginia Tech Hokies. I think the most impressive victory, though, was probably at 184 pounds with Reese Heller pinning Hunter Bolin. And you see this pin here. It's a defensive fall, and, I mean, it's a good, clean fall. I, I You know, it's a, it's a crazy defensive fall, not one that you see all the time, but he did win that. And the other thing that happened here is that as we got into the rest of this, you know, Reese Heller getting wins, uh, Bonacorsi getting a win, and then Dayton Pitzer, who has had a phenomenal season so far, beating Katka in sudden victory 5-3. to three. So that leads the question, how is the ACC going to turn out? Well, we have NC State who lost to Virginia Tech. We have Virginia Tech who lost to Pitt. And Pitt right now is undefeated in the ACC. They still have a couple of dates of competition left. But NC State, they beat Duke this weekend 46-3. They're likely going to beat Virginia. I see them matching up well and probably beating Pitt in North Carolina as well. Each of these, I think it's possible that they take a loss here. But I honestly think it's more likely that NC State wins out. So if they beat Pitt, then what happens? Because Virginia Tech, let's look at their schedule. Well, let's say NC State wins out, but then UNC somehow beats Virginia Tech. I don't think they're going to lose to Duke or Virginia, but UNC actually stands a chance to beat them. Well, let's just say that they win out for the sake of argument. That would lead to a three-way tie between these two teams. And I think ultimately, and this is my takeaway, is that this is going to end up coming down to the tournament, right? Whoever wins the regular season, it doesn't really matter. I think the ACC dual meet, like season is great, but the tournament is going to be where it all comes down because NC State has, honestly, four to five contenders to win titles in the in the conference. Pitt is about the same, four, five, six guys, and, and Virginia Tech is the same. It's going to come down to those other guys, how they place who they beat out, the matchups, the bonus point scoring. I'm telling you, this is going to come down to the wire between these four teams. Not just Pitt, Virginia Tech, and NC State, but also North Carolina. So let's hit some quick lightning headlines with Arizona State and Lehigh being a pretty fun match. This was one of my favorite moments from the match with Arizona State's Colton Schultz and Lehigh's Nathan Taylor going into this scramble, something you don't typically see from heavyweights. Now Colton Schultz ended up winning that match and Arizona State beat Lehigh 22-16. Another impressive victory that I have to point out was Nebraska over Wisconsin. And unfortunately, like Wisconsin started the season out pretty strong strong not so much in the end of this this part of the season they lost to Penn State okay Illinois man by a point Michigan 27 to 6 not that great they beat Purdue but then lost to Iowa they did almost beat them in that tiebreaker criteria then lost to Northwestern and Nebraska I think the most unfortunate part to come out of this duel me against Nebraska was that 
Wisconsin's Austin Gomez ended up getting injured. We didn't see him in the second dual meet of the weekend for Wisconsin, and it was unfortunate. I hope he's chilling up and getting better. And that moves to another guy who I thought was kind of interesting is Pat Glory. Because he stepped out again at 133 pounds as he's been wrestling this season. And in order for him to go down to wrestle 125, he's going to have to get some competition at the weight in order to qualify for nationals and, and get seated and all that. Because right now, he's been wrestling 133 all season. I've heard rumors that maybe he drops bound, down to 25. I don't know. We'll see. He's continuing to wrestle 133, and that continues to make things very interesting. And our third wrestling headline is that Ohio State and Iowa State recorded double sweeps on the weekend. First, we got to talk about Ohio State, who had an impressive weekend, starting off against Michigan. And Malik Houseman, who was returning from injury, came back with a top 20 win against Medley of Michigan, but it didn't stop there because it threw out this duel. Jesse Mendez, who had an impressive weekend, ended up beating Dylan Raguson. Uh, Jesse Mendez, a young guy, he beat Raguson this weekend as well as Rayvon Foley of Michigan State, who was an All-American in the past. This guy, Jesse Mendez, I promise you, is going to be a guy to watch in the national tournament. That leads to 141. Dylan D'Amelio earned a good win. Sammy Sasso earned a tech fall, which is always fun to see Sasso put up some points on the board. Will Wan did end up getting a victory over Patty Gallagher. And I'll mention the biggest matchup that ended up happening here. But Ethan Smith, Caleb Romero, Gavin Hoffman all rolled through. I think I enjoyed watching Caleb Romero get his victory over fine silver of Michigan, but probably the most crazy thing that happened in this dual meet was definitely Cam Amin getting a pin over Carson Hartzler in the overtime period. I mean, you don't see this happen in the tiebreakers often, right? It was one to one, and here we go. He tossed Hartzler to his back and stuck him. Hartzler has been struggling just a bit this year. I'm hoping to see him come alive more in the postseason. I know the Ohio State Buckeyes can sometimes struggle from being like impressive freshmen, right? And to struggle a bit when it comes to development down the line. Now, I love watching these Buckeyes do well, even though I'm not like a huge fan of the, the overall Buckeye, like Ohio State. I do actually enjoy Ohio State wrestling. Now, they did, and, and I'll say I'll cheer for them over Michigan any day of the week, but they ended up beating Michigan 23 to 15, but that wasn't their only win in Michigan because they beat Michigan State. 36 to 3. There wasn't a whole lot to note here. I mean, when you have a 36 to 3 victory, that's just kind of what happens. But it was a great, great sweep on the weekend. And as I mentioned, they weren't the only team that earned a sweep because the other team that swept out this weekend was Iowa State. 25 to 12, they beat Oklahoma, with the most impressive victory here being from Wiley Johnson, earning a last second takedown of Panero Johnson to beat him. Panero Johnson has had an incredible season so far, beat Austin Gomez, competed with Yanni, competed with the top guys at 149, and here we go, another 149-pounder pulling upsets. Are we even surprised at this point? This is a pretty straight-up dual meet for the most part. I think one matchup that I do want to show you, but just because it was such a very cool takedown here, was David Carr. It wasn't upset or anything, but look at that sick duck under. And the first four seconds, or last four seconds, of the third period. He is going to score points. 17-6 to six is what that final score ended up. Or 18-6, to six, excuse me, with the riding time. Over a ranked nine house. Unbelievable. I, unfortunately, I don't think that Carr is going to be that guy to win the Hodge Trophy. Just because there are other guys above him. Even if he does end up winning a national title. Which he still has a lot of tough guys to get behind. Or to get through, right? Keanu O'Toole being the top guy. Shane Griffith. But... He has had a great season so far. The other road victory that they had was 18-11 to over Oklahoma State. And this duel ended up coming down to the last matchup. With the last three guys of Iowa State coming in hot. Marcus Coleman getting a decision win. Younger Bastida, same thing. And Sam Schuler ended up putting this duel meet away for Iowa State. My takeaways here is that I really wish we could see Iowa State and Ohio State wrestle. These are two top five programs. And one of the things I'm really looking forward to is the Iowa State and Mizzou dual meet. But more importantly, the Michigan 
not Michigan, Ohio State and Penn State dual meet that's coming up this weekend. Because Ohio State positioned themselves in a really good place to see where they end up. Now, if you're wondering who the worst recruits are of all time who ended up doing actually pretty well at Nationals, check out this video right here. Those were your wrestling headlines.